Welcome to Men Talk, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the world of miscarriage, infertility, infant loss, and stillbirth. Hosted by Daniel Landau, founder of menshelpline.org, we'll be sitting down every week with real guys to discuss their stories, struggles, and triumphs. So grab a drink, sit tight, and let's talk. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Men Talk podcast, where men speak about miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, and infertility. Today's guest is Frank Ortiz. Frank, welcome to the show. Feel free to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit of your story, your journey, and your background, where you're from, and we'll take it from there. The floor is yours. Yeah, hey, hey Daniel. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me. Yeah, my name is Frank Ortiz. I live in Houston, Texas. I moved here from Massachusetts almost 11 years ago, running away from the cold and the snow. And uh, yeah, we, we love it here. We, uh, I am a father of five-year-old uh, girl twins. And we, uh, yeah, we did through, we went through IVF actually twice and yeah. And, uh, you know, been connected with some folks and and on Facebook and whatnot and, you know, really enjoying kind of talk back and forth with them and trying to help anyone in their journey. So you went through IVF and you had twins now, what was that, what was that journey like for you? What was that process? Was it difficult to say, okay, now I'm going to go through the IVF journey yeah, do all the mm-hmm. shots, do the treatments. What was that like for you? Yeah, so when we started this was maybe seven, yeah, seven, nine, yeah, so it's about seven years ago, we started this, and you know, we spent, we've been together since high school. So, um, I mean, we were, I mean, we never had a scare. Uh, you know, we never had any. You know, we we would use protection back then, but you know, sometimes we didn't use protection and stuff like that. So but again, we never. We never had any scare. So I always said, man, can I even have kids? So I remember a long time ago, maybe 15 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, scheduling an appointment with a urologist to see, you know, um, like if I could even have kids, you know, and actually I didn't even go to the appointment. I didn't, I didn't sleep that night. We were not even trying IVF or having kids per se, but I didn't even want to, uh, to know if I could or not. I didn't even go to the appointment. Actually, I remember Googling because uh, I didn't know what a man doctor, a doctor for men other than my regular doctor. So I actually Googled um, gynecologist for men. And <laughs> the first thing that came up was <laughs> urologist. I, I had no idea. I mean, I really didn't even know what a urologist did or anything. So that's actually how I found out that urologist is the doctor that men go to for that stuff. Yeah. So then, um, yeah, about seven you know years ago, we had we had been trying for about a year and a half or so to get pregnant. Uh, we did the whole uh, you know hormone thing and ovulation and and everything, and yeah, nothing was happening. But again, at this time we didn't know why it wasn't happening. Um, so then we go to an IVF doctor, and we see that um, actually no, I had I, I was working with a urologist, and we did a test. And he said that we that I had seven, uh, like actual seven, uh, you know, uh, sperm that could be used to to you know to you know have an embryo and whatnot. So I said, okay, well, you know, whatever. He said, you have a lot, but it's like a concert. They're they're in they're in, they're in a mosh pit. They're not going through. And again, you don't, if, if if of those seven go through, your chances are zero that they are going to go all the way. I mean. Normally it's millions of them, right? So, so then um, I said, "Well, it looks like I, I have the issue." We didn't know if my wife had any issues or not yet. So then we went to an IVF doctor, and you know, we realized that my wife had no issues at all to be pregnant. That it was 100% uh, my issue. And so then, okay, well, you know, let's 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 get this going. So then I did another test, and it had zero. So zero swimmers. I mean, zero sperm that could be used to uh you know to 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 get pregnant and then i'm like okay well I try it again and again it was zero so i said you know man that's that's terrible we used to go to the clinic every every couple of weeks because my wife was in this time doing injection to increase the egg production and all that kind of stuff um actually she did, she did great with that she never was afraid of needles i have a really good hand and everything i would just kind of try to make stories and try to say things just kind of you know get her head out of it and then i would just kind of poker and she, 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 bear, I mean, not one time she said, she said, ouch. So that, that's pretty good. But again, she was never nervous of any type of needle. So that does help. 
And then, um, all right, so I'm going to try it again. Um, so again, it was zero. So again, it was seven, then zero, zero. So then I said, the doctor, what are the alternatives? He said, okay, we're going to have to do extraction from the testicles. So I said, okay, I mean, I was like, I'll do what I, whatever I got to do. It's not, you know, it's not my wife's fault. Let me just do what I need to do. And then, so I asked him, you know, I'm a big guy. And I asked the doctor, you know, is being a big guy have anything to do with it? I mean, I'm a, you know, obese, like, you know, and he's like, well, you know, not usually, but not really. They like, kind of couldn't really give me an answer. So then I started doing some research, you know, and then I found that, yeah, that, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it could, it could mean, you know, someone's heavy, not having enough sperm. And also I, I also have a low testosterone. So being heavy kind of hits all of that point. So then I started just drinking water, taking vitamins, like a regular, regular GNC vitamin pack, not like a special program where they're like a, a you know, a thousand bucks, no, like a regular GNC. Uh, which now I take a regular that I just find on Amazon and I just mix it myself and do it at home with like little baggies. So, yeah, so I, then I started eating better, was not doing any type of uh, like fast food, you know, just doing whatever I could, working out. I mean, just walking, really, nothing crazy, walking the treadmill, a little bit of strength training, but just do something. And then so I went back for my last test before the extraction. I'm like, OK, so then I go and I you know do my thing. And a week later, we go to the doctor uh, for my wife because it was like to check, you know, how many eggs and stuff to schedule the, the, I forgot, the, I mean, I forgot all these terms now, but the extraction of her eggs to be able then with my sperm, whatever, right? So then before we leave, we're like, oh, so, you know, did you get my sperm count back? He's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we look good, we look good. I'm like, okay, what, like, how many? What does that mean? I mean, I'm expecting. Oh, you have 10 that we could use, you know, she's like 154,000. So I'm like, wait a second. So what? She's like, yeah, you have 152,000 that could be used for, um, for, you know, to be able to collect, to be able to get pregnant. I was like, that is crazy. I mean, I never had expected that. So we said, Hey, can we then just get, you know, pregnant naturally? She's like, well, still very low chance since, millions is you know kind of the normal the average so then so then we just continue with the ivf uh, uh, situation um then we uh, she got extracted i think it was 16 or 15 eggs that were fertilized and of which six of them made you know the cut they were like the double a or whatever you know they were the best of the best and then so my wife is a twin She's a fraternal twin, and you know we we didn't want twins because we didn't want them to be compared. You know, as humans, it's extremely difficult not to compare. I mean, you know, kids, movies, girlfriends, wives like it, it's something that something that comes very natural to humans. So we just didn't want to have to deal with that. With my, you know, have my wife having been compared to her sister. Uh, one of my wife's pet peeves is. Uh, oh, you know, like my wife, oh, you, you're the good twin. Your wife, your sister is a bad twin. Like she always hated that kind of talk. So we just didn't want that at all, right? So, you know, we, we tried with one and I'm like, well, Gina, you know, my wife, Gina, she doesn't have any issues, so this should work, right? And, you know, so we put one, we transferred one and, you know, a couple of days later, uh, maybe six days later, we did the test and we don't realize that it didn't hold. She wasn't pregnant. Um, I remember getting that call, you know, I, I think I took a, like a six hour nap on the floor. I mean, it was very sad, you know, and, you know, people, you know, and, and so, I mean, everybody has a different, you know, thought, but I mean, I think, you know, that they are babies, right? Like, you know, in my head, I'm like, I already made a life with this baby and everything. And now, you know, we don't have it. What happened? You know, my wife obviously felt a little bit guilty and everything like, you know, and the doctor's like, Things say something like 20% of embryos don't, you know, are not, don't make the whole thing, right? So we're like, okay. So then a month later, um, yeah, maybe a month or two months later, whenever her cycle happened and her period and, you know, kind of after that type of thing, we tried again. So this time we said, okay, doctor's like, you know, if we put two embryos in, my wife at the time, she was 32, so still young and, you know, healthy, you know, and everything. And he said, if you put two, we have like a 70% chance that at least one will hold. 
right? So, you know, we looked at each other, we're like, okay, yeah, we're ready. Like, you know, whatever we got to do. So two of them were implanted and two and two of them held on. I remember going to the, the other blood work where you, you know, where they find her hormones and they were through the roof, but we didn't know what that meant. We just thought, oh, it looks like they're going up and up. And then we went into for the ultrasound and the doctor was like, yeah, I actually saw that video the other day. It was, it was you know, kind of crazy. It's like, yeah, you have one and you have two. And we just looked at each other we're like, like what? And the doctor said, yeah, we, uh, I kind of knew it was twins because the hormones were just through the roof. So we have, yeah, so we, we uh, got pregnant with twins and the, the, you know, the, um, the actual pregnancy was perfect. My wife never had any morning sickness, never had any issues. Uh, the only hormone she had was just clingy and wanted to kind of be, you know, uh, you know, kind of on me all the time, you know, like kind of cuddly with me all the time. So, yeah, like we got lucky on that and that end, actually. And, you know, we, I kind of skipped a little bit with like medication and everything. So there was one time where um, we went on a Friday and my wife had to increase her pro- progesterone. And the pharmacy doesn't deliver stuff till Monday. So I went on one of these groups here before even, you know, the one where, where we met. Um, and I said, hey, you know, I kind of need medication. I don't know what to do because if you don't do the right thing, then you have to kind of restart all over. And I actually met a guy named Joshua who became really, we actually good friends. And, he, you know, they even became my client and everything. And he said, man, come here. It was about maybe an hour away. I'll give you, you know, his wife was pregnant already. So he's like, I don't need this medication because it goes bad after a while. And his insurance covered everything. So he gave me a bunch of medication, maybe like 1500 bucks worth, maybe more. And then another lady um, from probably an hour away also said, hey, I have I have this here. You could, you could also take it. And they raised that comment from that group because you can't ask for medication in these groups. Um, and there was another lady from Boston, actually, who um, from Massachusetts, uh, uh, South Boston somewhere. And uh, she sent us also medication as well um, in the in the mail with dry ice and everything. Um, so it was very helpful because medication is extremely expensive, for sure. Yeah. So if it wasn't for that, we probably wouldn't wouldn't have the twins because you know, the, especially that progesterone needs to be on time every time. You know, and we had to go out by maybe, you know, quite a bit where we were not going to have enough until Monday. Wow, quite a story. Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty cool story. And there was one time when we were in Houston in the rodeo and on the way back, it was the time to do the medication, but we got a flat tire. Oh my. And it, the tire blew up and then we're driving around with like, you know, I'm putting air to drive to like closer locations type, type of thing. And we're in a kind of rough area from Houston my wife is, you know, pulling up her shirt because I need to do it in the stomach. And some guy's walking up to me. I don't know what he wants. So I kind of inject her right away and I get out of the car. So I'm like, well, if he's going to try to fight me, at least, we, you know, we're at the same height type of thing. And um, so that was a cool story where, you know, we had to, we had to do that when we thought we were going to get like mugged or something. We don't even know where we were. It was like a like a crazy location. So luckily, we always had our lunch bag with, uh, with the medication, with with ice and everything, you know, just in case we had to do it on the road. So it worked out great. So that's smart to take it a dry bag because I've heard countless stories where someone's bringing their medication home from the pharmacy and they accidentally leave it in the car. They're going on the road yep. and these medications are extremely sensitive to heat. So mm-hmm. it's very important to remember that if you're yeah. going on the road, make sure you pack it with a lot of ice. Yeah. Even if, even if we renew or we, we did the ingestion at eight, eight or eight thirty every night, even if we knew we were going to be there early, we always took it with us because you just, you never know, you know? Yeah. So. Exactly. What was it like for you going back to earlier in your story? You know, you called the urologist, they say, oh, you have seven. And then like, was, was it a shock to you to think, hey, wait a second, you know, we're trying and usually people say it's the woman. And then all of a sudden, oh, wait a second, it's me. Like, yeah. no, a seven, a sperm count, then zero, not moving around. What was going through your mind and how did you, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, when, when I heard the story and then I also heard I had low testosterone and also, you know, the, the, the count of seven, 
I, you know, I thought like, you know, am I even like, you know, it's, I did have the thought like, man, I'm not a man enough to, to have, you know, testosterone. I'm not man enough to have like sperm. Like it's the only thing you would think that men should have enough of sperm and testosterone. Like what is going on here, you know? And then, you know, um, I quickly understood that, um, that that's kind of, I don't want to say toxic mindset because, you know, every, you know, but I don't think masculinity is toxic, you know, like to think, but basically I thought like, you know, I'm still a man. It, it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't matter what I do the hormones. I have, I have no control over hormones. Right. So, you know, and then, you know, that kind of pity party, I maybe had it for about, about a week or so. And then I'm like, well, this it's not my fault. There's nothing I could do. Um, you know, maybe, you know, if I knew that when I was young, that this was a possibility, maybe I would have started losing weight. Like, you know, in my twenties, I don't know. Um, yeah, but that mindset, I had it for about a week. And then I said, well, I'm still a man, even if, you know, I have an issue with testosterone and sperm, maybe even if I have soft hands, I'm still a man. Like I was, I was kind of justifying that I was a man regardless of what happened. Right. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, and also talking to people, uh, you know, uh, growing up, I didn't grow around, uh, didn't grow up a, a lot with, with gay, like gay people, like gay men. And I remember someone saying, always kind of assuming that gay men were not men. And I remember a long time, I mean, even before this, I was like, you know, because they like men doesn't mean they're not men. They're just men that like men. You know, so I always understood that man, being a man didn't really, you know, there's no, there's no kind of, you know, cookie cutter way of being a man type of thing. So I mean, I, my mom was like a man. She was a single mom and she had two jobs and she got it done. If that's how we're going to, you know, look at things. Yeah. So it felt really, it felt bad for about a week, maybe two weeks. And, you know, I, I, you know, I use uh food as stress, you know, reliever and, and, and stuff. So I remember eating a lot of crap and kind of eating a lot of ice cream, you know, but then I was like, Oh, you know, I'm still a man, even if I can't do it. And I would ask my wife, I said, do you consider me a man? She's like, of course it doesn't, you know? And then she said, and then she twisted around and said, if I was an issue, would you think that I wasn't a woman? I'm like, damn, like I, you know, she's like, well, that's true. And, you know, and that, that's kind of how, how, how we got through it, how I got through it. Sounds like a really good supportive wife. You know, that question is always strong. The first is, you know, the guilt theory. And then, Oh, you know, am I not a man? Because it's right. It's not in your control. You know, in fact, yeah. One in eight couples struggle with infertility. So it's not necessarily the woman's, it might be the man, but it happens. The person to your left, the person to your right. And the same thing goes with miscarriage. One in four, one in four pregnancies under a miscarriage. So it's, it, 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 it kind of goes together and says, it doesn't make you less of a man. And men really need right. to, to realize this, that it's hormones and it's not a hundred percent in our controls. Yep. 100%. What about with the miscarriage? You know, when you heard the news that 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 treatment, that cycle didn't didn't work, did you have the same type of reaction? I know you said, you know, you just fell apart for like six hours. You just fell asleep. Yeah. But was it the same thing? Did you feel less of a, you know, not necessarily less of a man, but that you could have done something better or trying to figure out what was the cause for that miscarriage? How, how did you deal with that incident? With that one, um, yeah, I just, I fell asleep for uh, the longest nap ever, just on the floor on the carpet, just like super sad. And I remember, you know, thinking about, man, like, you know, what did my wife, did my wife do something? Did she hold something really, really like heavy? Did she sleep wrong? Did, you know, I was trying to, I mean, I would never say like, hey, this was your fault type of thing. But it was like, you know, just to avoid it the next time, right? Um you know, I mean, it, it, it was sad to, to that point where, you know, I felt like I was trying to blame someone. And obviously that someone had to be my wife because she's the one that had it inside of her. Right. Uh, but then, yeah, same, same thing. I, I said, you know, that was just not, you know, you know, that baby was just not meant to be ours. And, you know, we, were, we felt blessed and lucky that we had five other embryos to do stuff with. Right. So, yeah, so that one, we were trying for a couple of days, you know, but not not to the point where, you know, um, like it would hurt us. And and we did that first one. I mean, people knew we were doing it, but they didn't know when we were doing the transfer and all that kind of stuff. So we didn't have to repeat the story all the time to everybody. And I think that kind of, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not a fan of people not telling friends about it, supporting friends. But, you know, 
um, just that, you know, that part, I remember being a, a good part where it was only my wife and I, maybe two friends that knew we had did the transfer and knew it didn't hold. So we only had to say like in, in one group text, basically. They were sad, called me, you know, but um, but it, it was easy to move forward from it because maybe, yeah, maybe three or four days we were sad, but that was it. So did it help to keep it a little bit, hey, quiet that we're doing a transfer, that you're doing a cycle? Or do you think it, you should t- people should talk about it more and say, hey, you know, I'm going through this. I don't know about you. You know, I don't know if you've gone through it, but that that support network and all, all of that, did that help you? The fact that you didn't tell as many people? Do you think people should? Um, I think people should tell people, you know, um, like should tell. I, I, the second time we did it, everybody knew. Um, you know, and I think I don't know why we didn't tell people. It wasn't we were not trying we were not trying to keep it silent, right? We were just like it just so happened where they had an appointment like a week later, and then we just did it right away. So it, you know, there wasn't enough. Like my wife didn't have to go through like a, a period cycle and blah blah. It was just like oh yeah, I just had my my period three days ago. It ended. Then we're ready like next week type of thing. So it just it just so happened that it was fast. Yeah, we were not trying not to tell people. Yeah, but telling people is important. I mean, I know, you know, I'm Hispanic and I know and my wife as well. I know that in a lot of Hispanic communities, you know, this stuff of IVF is kind of looked, you know, down upon because maybe God doesn't want you to have kids and blah, all this blah, blah, blah stuff. And we, we don't we don't see things that way. So when I told my mom, my mom understood. My mom was never... She never ever said that because I would have told her that you know, um, you know. I mean, I mean, I believe in God, but I don't believe in that type of thing where they try to kind of you know guilt you into not doing it, you know, type of stuff. And you know, I t- we told her mom. Her mom was happy, and my wife's twin sister did IVF um, maybe five years before we did. So you know, her mom already knew that that happened, and we're like, hey, now we're doing it right, and. My mom knew that my sister-in-law did it too. So it was easy to talk to her about it. But yeah, she, you know, I, I really didn't get any type of pushback from anyone. But it is very common in Hispanic communities. So um, to those folks that are that, just, you know, who cares? You know, when, when those kids are born, your mom and dad and grandma, they're going to be ecstatic that they are born. Just, you know, try to maybe tell some of your open-minded and, maybe uncles and aunts to kind of have more of that support of a motherly fatherly figure. Yeah. But if your parents say something about it, it's like, Hey, whatever, you know, again, I know it's easier said than done. Right. But you know, uh, cause my mom didn't react that way, but if she did, I was prepared to be like, whatever, you know, I wasn't going to lose that relationship because of something she didn't understand. Right. So. How do you suggest that we educate people about, about these issues and sensitivity of things that should be said or should not be said, you know, and, and spoken about? Because a lot of people just don't know how to react or don't know what to say and make stupid comments about it. Like, oh, even, you know, even in the Jewish world that I'm in, people, people are ashamed, people are embarrassed, they like to keep it private, they don't like talking about it. How do, how do we change that, that culture? Uh, I think it comes down to education. Right. And and I think it's understanding how maybe food these days had something a lot, you know, to do with it. Plus there's also things in the Bible where women couldn't have kids, right? And they they allowed uh was it Abraham to have sex with someone else for a baby? Like I mean that's crazy, but you know, no difference between that and and you know, getting eggs from another woman and fertilizing them and have a surrogate, right? If you think about it. So um yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's probably going to be more like, you know, this is what I'm doing. If you don't like it, whatever type of situation. I mean, it, but it's going to have to go a lot with education. Like this is this is one in eight people have issues getting pregnant. You know, one or four uh, people, you know, couples or whatever have miscarriages, you know, so so they know that it's not just you. Because before I did IVF, we did IVF. The only person I knew that did it was my sister-in-law. Right? I knew no one else. So, and now even the twin thing, like now that we have twins, we realize that there's a bunch of twins that had twins. But that's just a myth that twins, it jumps a, a generation. I have four cousins that had twins. So it's all, it's all BS, but, you know, 
if you if you don't have them yourself and you don't and you're not going through it, you will never hear about it. So I think that just being more open, you know, to tell people these numbers, one in eight, one in four, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's probably going to be the best way to uh, to do it. And knowing that if your parents or family say something, it's going to be a chance to put some boundaries and, you know, protect your wife. You know, maybe not like, you know, Will Smith did in the Oscars type of thing, but, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to be the man and also to be the wife and said, you know, mom, he's my husband. This is what we chose to do. Like, it's not up to you. You know, hey, mom, she's my wife. I don't appreciate those comments with my wife. It's, that's going to be your time of re- really being and stepping up for your wife and setting boundaries. And if people don't want to know about it, then don't tell them about it. That's really good advice. What did, or do you think that this whole process going through the IVF stuff, having the miscarriage, then transferring two embryos and, and wind up having twins, do you think it made you a stronger couple? Do you think it made you communicate better? Uh, it certainly did. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I am always very open on talking about like my struggles to help other people. You know, um, I, 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 uh, I minister to many guys about marriage and about childhood trauma stuff. I feel very comfortable talking, you know, cause I feel that, you know, those things happen so I could help other people. Uh, my wife talks about it as well, but just, she's not as open as I am, like, you know, with everybody type of thing. So, yeah, so we we keep kind of that balance, you know, and yeah, it made, it definitely made us stronger. And it was, it was easy because again, we had no kids, you know, so it was just us two doing this. It'd be hard if you had a kid and wait a second, you know, like type of thing and hold on, and, you know, you know, so we were just, just us two and our dog who sometimes would bark when I was, uh, you know, um, putting the injections because he thought I was, he thought I was hurting my wife, you know? So, but yeah, so, you know, it, it definitely made us stronger because we, we had a bond. We had a, we had some, we had a, you know, a loss quote unquote that we, you know, that we both knew what it felt like. Yeah. So it definitely, definitely did. But I could also see how, you know, it could be hard for many people, uh, you know, especially, his insurance doesn't cover it and it is, it is expensive. We have insurance, but it doesn't, didn't cover it. Oh. Um, I'm blessed that I do, I do well financially. So, I, you know, it hurts still a lot of money, but it wasn't something like, okay, now I have to go, you know, other than those medications that we got, you know, that, that were expensive and the ones we got for free, you know, it's, we still, we would have been able to afford it. Right. But there's people that have to do like one cycle every two years because you have to save up for it. And I could see how that could become a toll for sure. So I just say communication and for, and for men, um, you know, just to understand that your wife is juiced up of hormones and don't take things personal that time. Maybe you should go, go hang out with friends some more, or just kind of be separate for a little bit. Well, maybe their mood goes down a little. I mean, it's like PMS times a thousand, right? When they're in kind of these moods. So it's just not taking it personal. You know, yeah, my mom, my, my, my wife would kind of say things and I, I understood I'm like, yeah, you know, and just agree, just choose your battles at that time. Right. So wise words going to the cost of going to the cost of uh, doing these procedures. Do you think that things have to change in the United States? Obviously not necessarily going into the political world, but health insurance premiums. I feel like there should be a law in the United States saying insurance companies have to cover IVF because it's so expensive and it's a fundamental right that people are going to want to have kids. There's got to be some type of lobbying or some type of thing that, that we can all do to say, Hey, something's got to change here. IVF has got to be covered regardless if you're employed or not employed or self-employed. Like it's got to be covered. It's no reason why we should all go into debt over it. Yeah. Well, um, yes and no, because, you know, you know, my, my wife was a social worker for CPS, uh, Child Protective Services. And we, we you know, in the, the city we grew up in, in Massachusetts, it was a rough city, a lot of teen pregnancies, a lot of craziness stuff. And when we got married, we, we moved to the city next door to it but we still saw it 
And my wife had clients that said, hey, Gina, I have to have another baby to afford this. I, I, I just have to. And then they'll go punch the holes in a condom to have more babies. So they could continue to get help. So, you know, I think that would be, that's a dangerous part of it uh, there, I think. Um, I think, you know, I think insurance, you know, maybe not covered a hundred percent, but to be, to cover something, you know, if, uh, if this stuff is 20,000, 30, depending on where you go and stuff, you know, um, they should cover maybe 50% or something, or maybe if you have someone, you know, you know, when they get employed, maybe re- the, the insurance should recommend, Hey, go do your, you know, you and your wife, go get some type of physical, make sure that you both could have kids. And if one of you cannot, even if you're going to have kids in five years from now, maybe pay a little bit extra, 20 bucks every two weeks insurance or whatever. That way that part goes towards that. I don't know, something like that. But yeah, to have it completely free, it could be also very dangerous because, you know, uh, you know, you know, two people could say, hey, let's go have a baby just so we could get more, you know, more, uh, more help from the government. Hmm. Um, and then have, yeah, I mean, my wife had clients that had seven kids and they were 25. Wow. Just because they, they needed, they, they wanted, you know, they still needed the help and the food stands and the blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I think that's when it could be a little bit dangerous. Um, but I think, you know, even maybe make it tax, tax deductible, maybe even maybe, Hey, we spent 20 grand and you get to deduct in your taxes. Like that, something definitely has to happen because it is very expensive for sure. But having it completely free for everybody or having insurance company just being like included 100% to everybody, that could be very dangerous. So I think maybe maybe may have medications be a little bit cheaper or free, but I don't think that the whole thing should be free because it could be we get into some trouble. There's some people get into trouble and then you have kids into trouble if they're just, you know, being born and not really taken care of by their parents. You know, I think that's, those are my thoughts. I never thought of it on that side because it's, it's very different where I am. I'm actually in Israel right now. And uh, over here, it's actually free for the first two kids. So there's some, oh, no. so we actually didn't have to shell out any money for the IVF procedures, just some yeah. minor costs for the medications. I believe it cost mm-hmm. us all of maybe $200, $300. Yeah. And actually, uh, it's funny that you mentioned Israel. I, when I was searching online, um, I saw Israel has very high level IVF stuff. <laughs> I told my wife, hey, we could buy this medication and they could ship it here. He's like, are you crazy? <laughs> I'm like, Israel is like, they're not third world country. Like Dominican Republic, where we're from, that's a third world country. So I get it. But Israel is like legit. And she's like, are you, I'm not doing this. Um, but again, she, that's just, she's just very cautious. I mean, I get it, but she's very cautious. Because I was doing research on how to save like seven grand, right? Eight grand or 10, whatever it was. And um so, so it, 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 I didn't know you were there. So, so yeah, that, so you know what I mean. So medication is cheaper over there. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe, yeah, maybe that could be here too. Like if you have two kids, whether IVF or not, then, you know, it's, you know, it shouldn't be free. That, that could be another Subsidized. good way to put it. Yeah. Too many, too many families go into debt. They take out second mortgages on their home. They sell their cars. They, it, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy what's going on. I mean, yeah, I'm in some of the IVF groups, uh, IVF support groups where a lot of women are in, and I hear a lot of sad stories there, a lot of sad stories. It's insane. Mm-hmm. What would be your top pieces of advice to men going through this IVF and miscarriage journey? Um, just to understand that, you know, being a man, it's, it's, it's whatever, whatever you want it to be. Right. Um, you know, in the sense of, you know, whether whether you could whether you have enough sperm or not, you know, or you have low testosterone or whatever the case may be. Being a man has, you know, has a lot more to do than that. It's like with twins and vans, like, you know, people talk down vans, but I'm like right now it's all about convenience. My girls are five years old, you know, and those sliding doors, man, they're godsend, you know, especially when you have two car seats, one, you know, it's you you. And you park at the mall and then you, the guy next to you parked too close and you can't, you know, and it's crazy. So, um, you know, people have to look kind of the bigger picture of it, you know, and, and 
you know, and, and being a man or not being a man has nothing to do with what you wear, what car you drive, you know, it, it has to do with way more than that. And even way more, you know, than even who you like. Again, you know, again, if someone is homosexual, that's just, who, you know, whatever. Like, I don't, you know, doesn't mean that they're less of a man or less strong or whatever. Um, so just, just to go, go get, go get, that it's okay if, if you don't have enough sperm. Um, it's okay if you have low T. It's okay if you had a miscarriage. It doesn't mean it was your fault or something or, or, you know, it, it, or stillborn, whatever, you know, it, you know, there's, there's things that you can learn from it. And also, you know, get, if, if someone did have a miscarriage or had a stillborn or whatever other things that could happen to go get help, right? So like, you know, uh, some counseling, marriage counseling, you know, I, I, I do not mean to, to say that it was, it's easy, any of this stuff. And that would just immediately erase everything, you know, but, you know, a couple that went through a loss, you know, have, again, they have a bond that can never be explained. So if they get, you know, some type of counseling, marriage therapy or whatever, you know, to, to do it too, because even going to therapy doesn't make you weaker or stronger. It just means that you just, you, you actually probably makes you stronger. Say, Hey, I need a little bit of help. Let me, let's go here, you know, and, and, you know, men or humans, which we're, we're not, you know, we're not in a box where every, you know, you know, every size fits. So just to know that, just to know that it's okay, you know, to have some deficiencies, some areas where you think um, manly people shouldn't have, because time and time again, you know, we know that has something to do with it. Well, you say it's, it's so true, you know, get help. If you need it, speak to a therapist. There's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed about it. You know, it's a good resource. It's a good tool. Too often I hear, Men saying, I don't want to go to therapy. I don't really like sitting around a room and saying, how do I feel? What about my feelings? And being in a support group. But the answer mm-hmm. is really, if you need it, it's there. It's a resource and, and utilize all the resources around you and talk about it. The more you talk yeah. about it, the better you'll feel, the better you'll feel. And the better you'll feel, the more you'll be able to help other men going through it as well. So yeah. Frank. And the reason why, the reason why, the reason why men don't like going to therapy or support groups because sometimes we're conditioned and to believe that being sad or being unhappy, it's not manly, you know? And again, they're not going to say, Oh, I feel this way to their friend or to a, it's to a professional. So it's, it's extremely different when it's a professional versus just a buddy of yours. Maybe he's going to make fun of you. Like seriously, man, you're, you know, you're sad for that. Right. When a therapist like, Oh, you know, try to cover where it comes from and, you know, blah, 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 and make you understand why it happens. Yeah, just just go get help if they need it. There's there's definitely nothing. If you want to feel like a real man, go go to a therapy uh, session and talk about your feelings, and uh, that's going to make you more of a man. Than anything, definitely. And remember, remember, guys, you are not alone. The person to your left could have gone through it. The person to your right could have gone through it. The statistics don't lie. One in four pregnancies end in a miscarriage. One in eight couples struggle with infertility. One in one hundred sixty births end in stillbirth. And one in a thousand babies die of SIDS every year. So remember, you're not alone. Thank you so much, Frank, for coming on the show and sharing your story. If you want to be in touch with Frank, I'm sure he'd be happy to connect with you out in Houston, Texas. And uh, please don't be a stranger. Reach out to us for advice, for help. We'll help you get through this journey and stay strong. For sure. Thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate you. My pleasure. You've just listened to another great episode of Men Talk with Daniel Landau. If you've suffered from miscarriage, infertility, stillbirth, or infant loss and want to open up about it, reach out. We'd love to have you on the show. You can also join our Facebook group, or if you'd like to get involved and start a chapter in your neighborhood, visit our website, www.menshelpline.org today. Until next week, stay strong, and remember, you're not alone.